Please join me in welcoming tonight's keynote speaker, Michael Josephson. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, this is actually my uh, third public outing since I had a, an event of a quadruple bypass about three months ago. And I, I mention that because it gave me a perspective I want to share with you in the time uh, that, that I have with you. Um, if we, so th this is, if I can make it go forward, I think it's supposed to supposed to move when I move this is there there we go that's what it looks like um, the, 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 the part that's interesting about this and it's, it's relevant to, to how we live our lives and what's important is I thought it was perfectly healthy I had no indication of any kind of problem no cholesterol things I went in there because of I thought I hurt my arm and the bottom line is they end up discovering that I had a need for a quadruple bypass and when you go through something like that, and I said this was almost three months ago, about three months ago, um, you, one, you do a lot, you're in bed a lot, you know, and you think a lot, and you really try to think about what's really important and, and, and what kind of legacy you lead. And, and I feel pretty good. I mean, I've run a nonprofit institute for a long time, and I hope I've made some real contributions. But when you look at things really closely and ask yourself, have I done enough? or what should I be doing, or, or what, what, what have I not done? It's, it's a challenge, and, and one of the, uh, this actually comes from, from a poem that, that I did, but it all of a sudden became more significant. It's called, what will matter at the end? The question is what will matter. It's not how many people you knew, but how many people will feel a lasting loss when you're gone. What will matter is not your memories, but the memories that live in those who loved you, what will matter is how long you will be remembered, by whom and for what. And to me, that's the reminder of the fact that, that how we're living our lives, what we do and don't do, what we contribute, and what we give and what we take in society is our legacy. And it's how, it's, it's the memories that people will have. And, and it's, it's sort of earning your legacy and earning your own eulogy. Somebody once said, if you want to know how to live your life, Think about what you'd like people to say about you after you die, and then live backward. And so, to me, it, it caused the reflection of, 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 of things. I want to share with you a little bit about, about getting better and what it takes. And, and, and I think all of us can have some pride, and, and I realize that maybe the most I could say is, I'm a work in process. I'm not as good as I want to be. I'm not as good as I should be. I will never be perfect, but I can strive every day to be the best person I can be. And I can take pride that I am better than I used to be and not as good as I will be. And to me, that's the, the goal I, I have for whatever remaining time that I have on this sphere. And the one I want to urge you, and, 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 and start by commending you, you're here because you're giving, because you're donors, because you found that some piece of your life is, going to be, is dedicated to trying to find some ways to, to make the world a little better. And so, as I try to reflect on my own, have I done enough, or what should I do, I'm reminded of the, the, the statement, you don't have to be sick to get better. So it's not like beating myself up that I'm a bad person and certainly not suggesting that, that, that any of, of you are. But the real question then became is, how good am I really? And how good do I have to be to be good? You know, and, and I don't know the real answer to that. But I know my capacity is far greater than my contributions to date. And I want to suggest it's the same for each of you. And without in any way minimizing or demeaning the importance of the contributions you've already made, I'm going to honestly suggest, because I know it's the case in my life, you could double what you're giving and it wouldn't affect your lifestyle significantly. And if you just considered that to say, what if I doubled the amount that I'm giving? and find ways to increase it. And maybe some of you could do a, a significant multiple more of that. And realize that how much you could do in today's day to affect the lives of people, as opposed to waiting, you won't know what people do with your will and what happens afterwards. Now, I had already started a situation where I made some 
kind of legacy gifts in my lifetime where I'm, people are getting money during my lifetime as opposed to waiting at the end. There's so much more we can do. And it's, it's not only charitably, it's politically. And, and whatever side of the political spectrum you're on, to be active about solving problems. This idea of seeing problems and whining about it and complaining about it, it seems to me to, to be just, just kind of endless. You know, there's this story of three birds on a wire and two of them decide to fly south. And I ask you then, how many are left? Well, the answer is really three, because deciding to fly south and flying south are two very different things, <laughs> you know? I, I decided to be thin, you know, but I got a ways to go before that actually happens. But, but I'll tend to rationalize. So if I want a donut, I'll have a Diet Coke, you know, and I'll convince myself that somehow the Diet Coke, you know, offsets the donut. And this capacity we have to rationalize, like I, when I was thinking about whether I'm doing enough to rationalize, well, I'm, I'm you know, working in a nonprofit, I don't draw any salary, I'm giving all my own time. So I could have all these self-congratulatory justifications to why I'm not giving more, why I'm not giving enough. And the reality is, is they're just rationalizations. And the fact is, is that at least in my life, I know that I'm gonna be dedicated to trying to be more more proactive and, 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 and maybe more generous in terms of what I give, but it's still all getting off the wire and flying. It's not a matter of intentions. And when I see what's happening in this country and the inability, and again, I don't care what side of the problem you're on right now, I wanna keep it non-political from a partisan point of view, but people are getting shot and killed. We need to work on that problem, right? Whether the problem is going to be in gun control and you think that's it, or the problem is going to be in more uh, ways of, 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 of uh, screening the people who get, I don't know. You, but you can't allow this to happen. We can't allow this to happen where, 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 where the kind of terror that could be struck is happening. And I just use that as an illustration of the fact that if we look at these problems that need solved, and we must demand that our leaders work on solving the problem in some rational way, and then they're accountable for the fact that the solution they develop doesn't really work. And if not, let's do another one, or let's do another one. I mean, the same is true with healthcare. I don't care what side you're on. Everybody acknowledges on both sides of the, the coin that the process we have now has many, many deficiencies and it needs work. And I'm gonna suggest that the mindset that we should have is what am I doing to make the world better? Let's start with your own family, that's fine. You know, what am I doing to make the lives and world my, my family better and then my community and the like, but it's important. So, so it raises the issue, since my background is a little law professor, I get a little technical, so I say, well, logically, why be charitable? What are the answers? Well, the first thing you could do is say it's a smart thing to do. Everything from tax advantages, enhanced reputation, gratitude and the admiration of others, and reward in the afterlife, if you believe in that. Now, these are very positive things that can come from being a generous person. But if those are the reasons why you're charitable, it isn't real charity. It's investment. There's nothing wrong with it. The money spends just as well, you know, in terms of we can buy good things. But the point is, is that whenever our giving is based on what we get, you know, and that's the exchange, then we have to understand it's, it's an investment, you know, more than it is really giving. Well, what's the second reason? And, and a lot of people give for this reason, and thank God we have them, and I want even more people. But I don't want to confuse them with the people who are true altruists or philanthropists who really believe in the giving. The second reason is it's the right thing to do. Individuals and organizations, I believe, have a moral responsibility to help those in need and improve the world. My, my background is Jewish, and we have a phrase in Judaism called tikkun olam. And tikkun olam means to heal the world. And the responsibility that we're taught and we try to teach our children is, is that part of our responsibility is to heal the world. Sometimes that's affecting individual needy people and, and, and helping those in need. Sometimes it's just improving things and making the society better or, or, or having things flow better. But clearly, the moral reason really ought to be enough. But I think there's a third reason that we often just don't pay enough attention to, and that is it leads to a personally gratifying and sustainable personal life. Now, in a way, that's just the variation of number one, okay? You're getting something out of it. But the point is, is to recognize that when you give, 
When you make a difference in the world, when you can say, but for me, this might not have happened, or this is better, the sense of value that you have is itself self-justifying. So whatever your particular reason for giving is, is it seems to me a case can be made that giving should be a much higher percentage and I don't just mean money-wise. I mean of your time, of your wisdom, of your those of you who contribute to the board, you know, and our board members, that's a form of giving. But of saying, what portion of my energies in life can I devote to be saying, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to heal the world and make the world a, a better place. So the, the notion of Tikkun Olam is, is the idea of repairing the world. And it implies and suggests that the world needs repairing. <laughs> Do any of us doubt that? I mean, can any of us look at any kind of segment of our society and say, here's some opportunities for improvement? And so the issue is, is to see what part of the world are you willing to try to prepare? What do you, maybe it'll be in the arts, maybe it's in education and scholarships, maybe it's gonna be in, in, in medicine or contributions, there are just so many things. But to find something or have a variety of things that you could say I'm doing my share. Now, my motivation you know, for this honestly is, uh, my kids, these are, these are my five children. And uh, I worry about, all of them are still single at the times. And I wonder the kind of person they're gonna end up with, I hope is a person of good character. I hope it's a person who will make a positive difference in the world. And what example and what legacy do I have of them? And, and when I talk about legacy and even that thing of what people will think of you after you die, the most important people really to me are my kids. You know, I care about what they're going to think about me. What are they going to say, you know, at the time? And, and to the extent that I want to earn their admiration, and I want to earn their respect, I want to earn their pride that said, my dad was or my dad did. And so that mindset of trying to say that, how can I look at what I do? How do I look at my job? How do I look at my company in ways to say, is there a way that I can magnify the part of what we do so that we're affecting lives? Sometimes it's just giving jobs to people who really need jobs. You know, and maybe being more tolerant when they need tolerance, where they have an illness in the family and they need time off, and how you deal with that. But there are so many ways in which you can contribute to the well-being of people if caring becomes a critical, critical part of every decision that you make. The test of our progress is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. And that's part of the whole charitable notion of the fact that the, there are inequalities in the world. That doesn't mean it's inherently unfair, but it means that those of us who have more have an opportunity to give more. And from that opportunity, I believe, is a moral obligation. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir. You could easily say, what do you think I'm here for? I do that. And I'm saying, fantastic. Do more. Do more. Keep thinking about what more you can do in the different ways that, that you can make a difference in this, in this world. I would rather have it said, he lived usefully than he died rich. You know, another quote I like is, nobody ever said on their deathbed, I wish I spent more time at the office. You know, and you recognize that the kinds of things that consume us on a day-to-day -day matter aren't necessarily the kinds of things that are really drawing on our capacity to make profound and monumental differences in the lives of other people. The heart that gives gathers. This is, again, another way of just saying that, that as you begin to stop asking, what am I going to get from it? You know, what, what's, what's the payoff? As you stop asking that, you start automatically bringing, and I think accumulating, the kinds of, of contributions that you have every right to be proud of. And whether somebody knows it or not, whether it's anonymous or not. You know, there's a famous philosopher called Maimonides. And Maimonides did a scale of charitable giving. And he did an analysis of, 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 you know, in terms of nobility. So the lowest level, and, and it's still giving. It's, it's not like it's a bad thing. It's not a sin. But the lowest level is people who give for credit, you know, or benefit, name the building after me, you know, I, or get the tax deduction or the like. 
The highest level of giving, according to Maimonides, is those people who give without any need or, or request for recognition. Now, I'm not saying it has to be that way. I have no difficulty with people getting credit. In fact, in some ways, I like it because other people ought to know that there are people who are giving. And, and if everything is anonymous, you might not have that. But just to at least in your own mind say, as I can get purer and purer in my idea of the gratification of real altruism is making a difference. And it's not getting credit for it, you know, whether you get credit for it or not. And being willing to do that and realize you're unappreciated in some cases, but you still know that what you did was meaningful and valuable. This is an interesting, there's a fellow named Tony Ord. I hadn't known about him, I just was doing research for this. And he founded a group called Giving What We Can and that's a website and had a lot of these quotes and other things. But it's interesting, his, his observation, he said. He said, I realized that my money would do vastly more good for others than it could for me and decided to make a commitment to donating to the most effective charities I could find. And I think that's why some of you are here. You know, obviously you've made some decision along those lines. But I think that's really important to realize is that there comes a time when your basic needs are really met, you know, and what you're going to do with the incremental sum is, is not going to be really materially affect. In fact, in some ways, I'm finding more and more, I'm turning 75 in, a, in this month, uh, well, next month in December, and, and I'm saying, it's, I got too much stuff. I mean, my real problem is now, what do I do with all this stuff? I don't need all this stuff. And, and to realize some of that stuff could make somebody else's life much, much more enjoyable, or it could be sold to make it more enjoyable. But the idea of saying it could do more for others than it could do for me. You know, in the end, and many of you have heard this story and seen this story, but it's, it's a meaningful one to me. And you know, it's a story about this young man. He's walking on a beach, and he sees all these starfish, and they're drying up and dying. And he begins to throw them in the water. And this old guy walks by and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm saving these starfish. If I don't put them in the water, they're going to dry up and die. And the old guy says, this is crazy. There are hundreds of them out here, maybe thousands. What you do doesn't make a difference. And it won't make a difference. And of course, of course the great answer is, it does, it does to this starfish. And the recognition that, look, nobody can do everything, but everyone can do something. And whether you can save just one starfish or a whole beach worth of starfish or whatever or not, the idea simply is, is you don't not do things because you can't do enough. Because anything you do is better than it was before. And so the notion of it does to this starfish is just a reminder that even any single act, maybe you start slow, I'm asking you to double what you're giving, okay? Maybe that's too much to ask some of you. Okay, 10% more, 15%, more, more, better. That's all I'm asking. And see if you can save a few more starfish and have the pleasure of, of saving the starfish. I know our own institute benefits from that. And this is not, a, this is not an appeal for, for the money. But we have scholarships and we give things and, we, you know, and we're a nonprofit 501c3. So anybody who's run on 501c3 understands how important it is to have some funds and some support. And so find the one that does the business that you want it to do and give it, give it support and, and save it one starfish at a time. Um, this is just the quote I already mentioned, but the idea of if you want to know how to live your life, think about what you'd like people to say about you after you die and then just live backwards. And it really is the idea kind of of what, it, what it's like if you're in effect writing your own eulogy. You know, what, what if you could, could do this and say it? And then this quote from Harold Kushner, our souls are not hungry for fame, comfort, wealth, or power. Our souls are hungry for meaning, for the sense that we have figured out how to live so that our lives matter, so that the world will be at least a little bit different from our having passed through it. And that becomes, again, the, 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 the test of your own worthiness. Is the world better because I have passed through it? I think of this story with this young man who's on his way to his uh, place of worship, and there are traffic issues where he has to go on a detour. And he ends up being detoured through parts of the city that he hadn't really seen before. And he sees poverty, and he sees drug dealing, and he sees, obviously, a, a lot of suffering that in his more privileged life, he hadn't really seen as visibly. 
So when he gets to his place of worship, he's shaken by this. And he says, Lord, I don't understand. How can you allow all this pain and suffering and do nothing? And of course, he doesn't get an answer. But he's a young man and he's impetuous. And so he repeats it again, but this time a little more loudly. He says, Lord, I don't understand. My faith is at issue. How can you allow all this suffering and pain and do nothing? Then he hears a voice behind him say, he didn't do nothing. He made you. 